Retina Rounds, episode number 127, post-vitrectomy cataract. We know that pars plane of vitrectomy, especially when a tamponade agent is used, will promote the progression of a cataract. However, this typically happens over the course of many months to over a year. When a cataract forms rapidly after vitrectomy, you have to be concerned for the possibility of posterior capsular damage or violation at the time of vitrectomy. Now that's the scenario facing guest surgeon Dr. Jonathan Lin, a second year vitreoretinal fellow, and his attending Dr. Esan Rahimi. The patient is a 57-year-old status post buccal and vitrectomy for a macula involving retinal detachment, who developed a rapidly progressive cataract shortly after vitrectomy. The patient was referred to Dr. Lin for cataract surgery and possible vitrectomy lensectomy given the high suspicion for posterior capsular violation. Let's see how Dr. Lin manages this case, and at the end we'll talk about some preoperative and intraoperative considerations when performing these cases. Okay, starting at the beginning of the case, you can see here Dr. Lin is creating a clear corneal incision. And you'll notice too that uh, trocars have not been placed. So right now, uh, Drs. Lin and Rahimi are going to try for an anterior approach to remove this cataract with a plan for placing trocars and performing a pars planar lensectomy uh, should that become necessary. Now, a needle is being used to uh, remove any liquefied uh, lens material so that when the capsulorexis is created, uh, they don't encounter an Argentinian flag sign. Uh, you can see some tripan blue has been used and the capsulorexis is created. Some hydrodelineation is being performed. And now the phaco emulsification probe is being used to debulk some of this uh, very dense lens material. So, uh, using uh, the phaco probe to sort of bowl out uh, the lens, uh, again, trying to debulk uh, this lens material as much as possible. Now Dr. Lin has gone uh, to using a uh, viscoelastic on a cannula, and that viscoelastic he's using uh, to viscodissect the lens away from the posterior capsule. And so this is going to be a gentler way of uh, creating some space between the lens and the posterior capsule. It's also going to serve as a really good barrier so that if there is a posterior capsular uh, violation, that viscoelastic is going to serve as a barrier and hopefully prevent any lens material from migrating into the posterior segment. Now using the phaco probe and uh, the chopper, some of this lens material is being broken up into smaller pieces and being removed. Uh, and you can see here now as uh, some of these, uh, these pieces of lens material are removed, you can see that there is in fact a posterior lens, uh, a posterior capsular violation. And so some viscoelastic is being used here as a barrier. Unfortunately, that viscoelastic has pushed one of those fragments into the posterior segment, so that will have to be addressed a little bit later on. Uh, one strategy here is to use the viscoelastic to get underneath the lens fragments rather than pushing on top of the lens fragments. Again, that's going to help to decrease the likelihood of the lens uh, material going or migrating into the posterior segment. Also a good idea to, uh, to bring this lens material up into the anterior chamber, which is what Dr. Lin has done, uh, doing the, the bulk of the, uh, of the phaco emulsification uh, in the anterior chamber away from that posterior capsular violation. Uh, now the uh, IA probe is being used to remove some cortical fragments, and you can see some of that lens material just floating around in the posterior segment. Dr. Lin is being, um, is be being uh, very careful not to go back and trying to fish for that lens material. Much safer to do that through a pars plana approach, and we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, at the end of the case. So, so once some of this uh, cortical material uh, has been removed uh, using the IA probe, then he can uh, uh, put in a lens, probably going to be a three-piece lens in the sulcus, uh, but let's see what uh, type of lens Dr. Lin and Dr. Rahimi choose. So here's that lens coming in. You can see, yes, it is a three-piece lens uh, with that leading haptic being delivered into the sulcus, and now the trailing haptic being dialed um, into, uh, into the sulcus position as well, and that optic can be captured um, uh, behind the anterior capsule, which looks to be completely intact. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like there's been any uh, zonular damage here, just a posterior capsular uh, defect. Now, once that lens is in place, the corneal wound is closed using nylon suture. That's going to help to make sure that um, the, uh, all the wounds are watertight and that it's a, it's a stable environment for a vitrectomy. And now the uh, light pipe and a vitrectomy probe are introduced into the posterior segment. You can see those posteriorly migrated lens fragments that are removed. Some viscoelastic in the posterior segment is also removed. Now using the vitrectomy probe, you can see that there are some cortical fragments that are remaining. And so uh, with that uh, vitrectomy probe, 
uh, just aspirating uh, those uh, residual um, cortical fragments can be removed. The lens looks to be uh, in really a uh, nice position. Looks like some myocol is placed into the eye. Those uh, trocars have been removed. The wounds have been sewn shut. Uh, and uh, just double checking to make sure everything is, uh, is watertight. A uh, good idea here to also inject uh, some, uh, some subconjunctival antibiotics. Certainly intracameral antibiotics are also a possibility. So here are your take home points. Now, preoperatively, when you're evaluating a patient with a post vitrectomy cataract, it's helpful to consult with the retina surgeon to determine how rapidly the cataract developed and if the surgeon had, a, had any concerns for posterior capsular violation uh, during the vitrectomy. Now, high risk cases are going to be those in which more aggressive anterior shaving was performed, uh, which may not only damage the lens capsule, but may also have damaged the zonules. Now, for retina surgeons, it's important not to allow instruments to uh, cross the midline and go to the contralateral periphery uh, since they may easily make contact with and damage the posterior capsule. During your preoperative assessments, it's important to look very carefully for any lens capsular defects, especially linear defects that may have been caused by the vitrectomy probe or the light pipe. Now, if the cataract is very dense, ultrasonography and especially UBM can be helpful to identify any uh, posterior capsular defects. It's also a good idea at this point to look for any phacodenesis, which may indicate zonular laxity or zonular damage. If it's unclear whether or not a posterior capsular violation is present, the cataract surgeon has to be prepared for all possibilities. Now certainly a single piece lens or three piece lens can be used if the capsule is intact, but if the capsule is violated, the surgeon should be prepared to place a three piece lens in the sulcus. In post vitrectomy eyes, the lens may have an effective position that sits a bit more posteriorly than uh, in a, a non vitrectomized eye. And so targeting a slight degree of myopia with your lens calculations can help you to avoid a hyperopic surprise. Now, the surgeon has to be prepared for other possible complications, including zonular laxity, which may require a capsular tension ring or maybe a capsular tension segment. If the capsule is completely compromised, a three piece lens can be scleral fixated using the Yamani technique or a different lens uh, based on the surgeon's preference can be chosen for possible scleral fixation. And last, if you're not a retina surgeon, it's a good idea to have a retina surgeon on standby in case a parse planar lensectomy becomes necessary. And the bottom line here is be prepared in advance with a game plan with all possible contingencies in place to deal with issues as they arise. Now, intraoperatively, remember that vitreous is more dense and less compressible than BSS or aqueous, and therefore post-vitrectomized eyes will have less support for the lens, making it more likely that the anterior chamber will be deeper than normal and that the lens will be more, uh, more mobile posteriorly. Now, decreasing the infusion pressure can help to normalize the anterior chamber depth during cataract extraction. Now, if a capsular defect is anticipated, it's best to avoid hydrodissection and instead perform hydrodelineation with viscodissection using a dispersive viscoelastic, and that was demonstrated nicely by Dr. Lin and Dr. Rahimi. The viscoelastic will serve as a barrier to prevent lens pieces from migrating posteriorly. And when possible, try to mobilize the lens pieces into the anterior chamber and use the viscoelastic to keep the lens material away from the posterior capsule. In some cases, it may even be safer or more efficient to convert to extracapsular cataract extraction, possibly with an M6 incision. And finally, if lens pieces do fall to the posterior segment, even in a post vitrectomized eye, it's best not to go fishing for these pieces from the anterior segment. Even after vitrectomy, anterior vitreous may still be present, and it's much safer to have a retina colleague remove posteriorly migrated fragments through a pars planar approach. Now this is a great case that was very nicely managed. Uh, the patient in this case ended up doing very well and we want to thank Drs. Lin and Rahimi for sharing it with us. And thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please visit us at retinarounds.com. There you can sign up for our email list. You'll get a notification every time a new video is posted. And if you have an interesting video or a tip or trick that you'd like to share, please follow the links on our website and you can upload your video there. Thanks so much for watching.